In October of 1974, a man named Carl Higdon had a series of bizarre experiences while hunting elk in southern Wyoming. He was taken aboard a strange transparent craft before being literally dropped back down to earth in a state of utter confusion. Carl's case is significant not just for its fantastic narrative elements, but for the fact that it appears to have been an aborted disappearance. In this way, it may tell us something not just about UFO abduction experiences, but about a subset of missing persons cases with which they might share a cause. In October of 1974, Carl Higdon was 40 years old and working as an oil driller for AM Well Service in Riverton, Wyoming. On Friday, October 25th, he had an unexpected day off, so he decided to go elk hunting. He packed his new 7mm Magnum rifle and headed south towards McCarty Canyon, which is around 40 miles, or 64 kilometers, south of where he lived in the small city of Rollins. During his drive, Carl pulled over to help two fellow hunters whose pickup wouldn't start. Over coffee, the hunters told Carl that he'd have better luck in the woods. Carl took their advice and headed to the northern edge of Medicine Bow National Forest. He parked his pickup on a hill and had a brief discussion with the game warden, who happened to be there. It was around 4 p.m. when Carl began his hunt. He walked less than a mile into the forest when he arrived at a clearing. He noticed five elk a few hundred feet away, all entirely still. He pointed his rifle at the largest male and pulled the trigger. To his surprise, no sound was made, and the bullet left the barrel in slow motion. It stopped around 50 feet in front of him, seemingly hitting something invisible before dropping into the snow. Strangely, the elk didn't flinch and Carl noticed that the forest was unnaturally silent. After retrieving the bullet, Carl noticed a large transparent box on the ground that was five feet high, five feet wide, and seven feet long. It looked to be made of glass and was empty inside. Sensing something nearby, Carl turned around to find a strange looking humanoid floating upright before him, wearing a black suit similar to that of a scuba diver. Carl estimated the being to be around 6 feet 2 inches tall and 180 pounds. Its skin was like that of an East Asian person, with a face similar to a human's, but with no chin and a severely receded jaw. It had no eyebrows, no ears, and small slanted eyes. Its coarse straw-colored hair stood out from its head like bristles on a broom, grouped into small bunches spaced a half inch apart. There were two distinct rods coming from the top of its head that looked to be antennas. The entity was wearing black shoes and a wide belt with a six-pointed star where the buckle would be and a yellow symbol below it on a type of small apron. Its legs were noticeably bowed outwards. It had no hands, but there was a cone-shaped appendage or device sticking out of its right sleeve. Higdon referred to the being as a man suggesting that it had some male characteristics. The entity moved towards Carl by floating over top of the snow. When it got within a few feet of Higdon, it asked him, Are you hungry? Though its lips never moved when it spoke. Carl replied in the positive, then a small envelope or packet of four pills floated towards him, and the entity told Carl to take one. Though Carl was normally extremely reluctant to take pills, he promptly swallowed one as if he were being controlled, as he put it. The entity then asked Carl if he wanted to go with it, and he replied, I might as well. Carl expressed that this latter choice was his own. Having read about UFO encounters in the past, he had previously resolved to go with the Euphonauts should he ever encounter one himself. The entity pointed its cone-shaped appendage at Carl, then suddenly he found himself elsewhere. Carl's next memory was of being inside the transparent rectangular box, itself seemingly within a larger transparent structure, both still resting in the forest. Carl was sitting in a type of bucket seat with his arms and head restrained. In the reflection on the glass above him, he could see the five elk standing motionless in a cage. 
The entity from the forest was in the room, and two more similar beings were also nearby. Carl said, you've got my elk, and one of the beings shrugged. The box lifted off the ground, and Higdon looked down to see his truck where he'd left it, but then the main entity waved its hand and the truck disappeared. Carl's next memory was seeing what he described as a blue ball and a huge marble, seemingly the earth, in the distance far below him. The beings told Carl that they were going home, which they said was 163,000 light miles away. Then they put a helmet on him that had six wires sticking out in all directions, and fastened a strap under his chin. Next, everything went black before a very bright light came on, causing Carl's eyes to burn and water. Carl was now standing in front of one of the transparent walls of the outermost structure, looking out into a giant featureless space, with no visible walls or ceiling. The light was coming from the top of a tower that he likened to the Space Needle in Seattle, Washington, with lights rotating around the top. Below the tower he could see several humans, adults and children, in casual discussion. Two entities, one being the one that Carl met in the forest, took him down a long walkway towards the tower. This time, Carl was floating, just like the entities. He was led to a door that lifted up, before he was taken inside a large room. While inside, a 4 by 8 foot shield or wall dropped down in front of him, then lifted back up again into the ceiling. One of the entities then approached him and said, You're not what we want. We'll take you back. Higdon was then floated out of the room, back into the bright light. His eyes burned again, and the entities told him that the sun affected them in the same way when they were on Earth. Higdon was then floated inside of what he called a craft, where he encountered the entity from the forest, who now identified itself as Ozo-1. Ozo explained that it too was a hunter, and that its kind had been coming to Earth for many years in search of fish and animals to make into food pills. Each pill fed one of its kind for four days. Ozo went on to say that their ocean had turned yellow, and that all the fish had died. It then showed Higdon a map of its planet, which was at least partially reproduced in the symbol on Ozo's apron. It told him that the nine planets of its solar system supply the magnetic force for their power. It also examined Higdon's rifle, remarking that it would have liked to keep the primitive weapon, but was not allowed to. Ozo also told Carl that their kind wear black to protect them from our sun. After the craft passed through a dark void, Carl could see that they'd arrived over the forest. Then, Ozo told Higdon it will see him. To his surprise, Carl then found himself floating down to the ground below the craft. Before landing, his foot slipped on a rock, causing him to fall, roll down the hill, and hurt his shoulder. Carl followed a nearby road until he came upon his pickup truck but didn't recognize it as his own. He sat in the truck and heard voices on the CB radio. After figuring out how to use it, he managed to connect with someone, who turned out to be his boss, Roy Fleming. Fleming asked for his name and location, but in his confused state, Carl was not able to give either. I don't know. I'm so cold. He simply declared that he was in a pickup with a funny stick in the middle, despite having learned how to drive stick shift as a youth. It was around 6.30pm when Fleming first heard from Higdon. Carl's wife, Marjorie, returned from work around 4pm with a growing uneasy feeling and an urge to get to her husband, and was soon alerted to Carl's distress call on the CB. Carbon County Sheriff Charles Ogburn organized a search party consisting of himself, Deputy Sheriff Ed Tierney, and four local hunters. Marjorie called her friend, Marilyn James, whose husband, Don, took them out in his truck to help the search. Due to the muddy roads, the sheriff's team had great difficulty reaching the area where they suspected Carl's pickup to be. Marjorie and company were told to stay on the hill and await further command. After a long wait, 
Marilyn felt the truck moving, before excitedly pointing to a large moving star that was changing colors. Everyone in the vehicle then watched for around 20 minutes as the light moved in a large arc while flashing brightly, switching color from red to green to white. The search party announced that they'd found Carl around 11.40 p.m. His truck was found roughly three miles from where he'd originally parked it, stuck in a mud hole, with no tire tracks leading to the site. While waiting for the searchers to return to the forest gate, the trio noticed that a big, bright red-orange light was rising on the eastern horizon, which they took to be the sunrise. They only realized how unusual it was after seeing the real sunrise later that morning. When the search party returned, Marjorie immediately noticed that Carl was still in a confused, amnesic state. He had difficulty talking and didn't recognize her. Marjorie tried speaking to him, but he only looked back as though he were looking through her, in Marjorie's words. Asked if he shot an elk, Carl looked up through the windshield and said, They took my elk. They took my elk. In a type of sing-song voice, as Marjorie described it. Carl was visibly cold, so she tried to drape her coat over his shoulders, but he pulled back in fear, crying, Don't touch me! On the drive to the Carbon County Memorial Hospital in Rollins, Carl asked Fleming why he wasn't dressed in black. Doesn't the sun burn you? When Carl arrived at the emergency room at 2 a.m., his eyes were watering profusely, apparently from the hospital lights. His shoulder was in pain, and he repeatedly asked for his pills that float to you. No bruises, bleeding, or broken bones were found. Test results detected no drugs in his system. Dr. R.C. Tonko determined Carl was experiencing amnesic shock. When Marjorie asked him his name, he replied, They keep calling me Carl. Who is Carl? During his time at the hospital, Carl narrated some elements of the experience, but had trouble remembering it all. Marjorie gave him a pencil and paper, and instructed him to write whatever he could recall. He drew a picture of the entity, then wrote the word Enders. The deputy sheriff later revealed that another man named Enders was in a different part of the forest that night. Carl also drew a forked road, a rough sketch of the transparent craft, listed two unidentified addresses, and made another note about a truck. Higdon was released from hospital the morning of Monday, October 28th. The results of the x-rays performed by Dr. Tonko found nothing of concern, even though Carl had x-rays taken years before the incident that showed scar tissue on his lungs from a past case of tuberculosis. Carl also had several kidney stones before his experience, but none after. Still, days after being rescued, he experienced headaches and a pain in his back. When Carl spoke to Sue Taylor, a reporter for the Daily Times of Rollins, he was still very much mystified by his experience, confessing that he must be crazy. Taylor's article, the first on the case, appeared on Tuesday, October 29th. Fleming put Carl in touch with a local rehabilitation counselor, who in turn suggested that he speak with Dr. Leo Sprinkle, a psychologist at the University of Wyoming who is interested in UFO experiences. On November 2nd, Dr. Sprinkle drove to Carl's home for the first of several regressive hypnosis sessions. Higdon was able to put more pieces of the experience together, and Sprinkle invited a local art teacher to make a drawing of Ozzo 1. Dr. Sprinkle went on to meet with Marilyn James, Sheriff Ogburn, Dr. Tonko, Carl's nurse at the hospital, some members of the search party, and several locals. Those who knew Carl said that they considered him honest and hardworking. Psychological and psychiatric tests at the University of Wyoming revealed no signs of mental illness. One evening, Carl suggested to Marjorie that they go out for a drive with their son. Carl drove a few miles south of town, taking a dirt road up a hill, seemingly knowing where he was going. Over 150 feet in the sky above them, the family saw a bright green light shaped like a large upside-down ice cream cone, 
and smelled a terrible odor of dirty socks and sulfur. Dismayed, Carl then announced, I am late. I was to be here a few minutes earlier. A few nights later, Carl woke Marjorie and said, I know it is weird. I am in bed with you, yet I am out south of town. They are telling me, look for a black box. He felt that they were telling him that they could contact him whenever they wanted to. This made Carl quite distressed and triggered his shoulder pain. Numerous times on Carl's drive to and from work, he was followed by lights in the sky that others saw as well, and both Carl and Marjorie felt that their phone was tapped. Carl claims that he still has telepathic communication with Ozzo on rare occasion. For example, Carl once told Ozzo that Rollins needed some rain. The next day, it rained three inches, then another two inches the following day, before he told Ozzo to stop and the rain ceased. Higdon speculated that before shooting his rifle on the day of the incident, he had entered some type of force field that slowed his bullet down. At one point, Carl, along with Don, Marilyn, and others, returned to the location of the incident to take pictures and scan for metal, seeking in vain to find the missing lead of the bullet. At the spot where the transparent box had sat, they noticed that nearby leaves were burnt, and some trees in the area had strange weathered carvings. The bullet was examined by investigators led by Dr. Walter Walker, a metallurgy consultant for the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, or APRO. Walker could only conclude that it hit something hard to turn it inside out. The bullet was also later examined by a metallurgist at the University of Wyoming. Sometime after, the bullet disappeared from the university's safe. The TV crew for the show In Search Of visited Rollins, as did a Japanese film crew. The National Enquirer also arranged for Carl to take a polygraph test, which he passed, the first of several. Marjorie said that she was compelled to write Carl's story decades prior to self-publishing the narrative in 2017, under the title Alien Abduction of the Wyoming Hunter. In 2022, David Polides made one of several documentaries about people going missing in unusual circumstances. Polides conducted new interviews with Carl and his wife, and compared the case's similarities to other disappearances in the same region. Polides noted the significance of Higdon being dropped at the end of the incident. This is consistent with hundreds of cases of unusual deaths that he investigated, where the recovered body appeared to be dropped from above. The fact that there were apparently no tracks leading up to the muddy spot where Carl's pickup was recovered, suggests that it was dropped as well. Researchers such as Linda Moulton Howe have documented that many cases of animal mutilation involve carcasses with broken legs, no surrounding tracks, and impacted soil, suggesting that they too were dropped. Carl believes that some type of medical examination occurred when the shield or wall dropped in front of him, and that he somehow failed the test. While Carl initially speculated that he was rejected due to the effects of the light on his eyes, he later suggested that it was due to his vasectomy. The fact that Carl apparently healed from his lung scarring and his kidney stones is also significant. Preston Dennett has compiled over 300 cases involving spontaneous healing connected to a UFO or entity encounter. Dennett concludes that the beings in these encounters are advanced extraterrestrials, neither benevolent nor evil, healing people for reasons beyond just testing and experimentation. There was a disappearance in the same forest that Carl was abducted from almost exactly 35 years later. Mark Anthony Strittmatter had 15 years experience hunting in the region at the time he disappeared on October 19, 2019. Similar to Higdon, the spot Mark disappeared from happened to be an area he'd never hunted in before. Interestingly, at the conclusion of a previous hunt, Mark saw a black UFO that followed him for a time. Like Higdon and many other missing persons, Mark was of German ethnicity, but never had a vasectomy. 
Ufologist Jacques Vallée has noted that many historical encounters with fairies, elves, and other mythical creatures involve the experiencer being offered some type of food. In several such cases, people who cooperate with the fairy folk are rewarded with an inexhaustible food supply. At the same time, Irish tradition holds that if you take food from the fairy world, you become a fairy yourself and never return to the mortal realm. There are many other UFO-related entity encounters on record that involve the beings floating over the ground or otherwise moving about in a very unusual way. For example, the creatures that emerged from the craft at Pascagoula, Mississippi floated out of their craft, and the so-called goblins at Kelly Hopkinsville hovered over the ground by swaying their hips back and forth. Another unusual detail is the fact that Ozzo measured the distance from his planet to Earth in light miles, rather than light years. Many UFO abduction experiences contain absurd elements like this. For example, the Italian abductee Pierre Fortunato Zemfreda claimed that giant guild aliens told him that they came from the Third Galaxy, an extremely simplistic and astronomically meaningless description. Reading Higdon's account, it is easy to infer that he was meant to be taken away forever, but was unexpectedly rejected. It may be that some people who have gone missing under unusual circumstances were abducted in a similar manner, and simply not returned again. In other words, the kinds of missing persons cases investigated by David Polides may be due, in part, to the same phenomenon responsible for many UFO abduction experiences and other anomalous entity encounters. Whatever reason his abductors had for rejecting Carl, it may very well have saved his life. Want to see more from Think Anomalous? Remember to click the bell so that you get notified when we make new videos, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Think Anomalous is created by Jason Charbonneau. Research and draft script by Clark Murphy. Music by Josh Chamberland.